All of my fantastic friends out there, and thank you so much for joining us here today. My name is Ross, and I'm coming to you live from Moat Marine Laboratory, located in Sarasota, Florida. Now, thank you so much for tuning in today for a part of our Summer Science Guest Expert Series. So this is one of our programs that will be taking place throughout the summer, highlighting amazing researchers that we, hear, that we have here at Moat Marine Lab in lots of different areas of marine life, just different types of marine science and different areas of contemporary, up-to-date, cutting-edge research. Now, today we have a really jawsome presentation for you. Today we are going to be learning all about sharks. Now, I'm not sure if you can tell based on my studio here or even my logo, but sharks, they're kind of our claim to fame. So Moat Marine Laboratory was started back in 1955 with our founding director, Dr. Eugenie Clark, and she was a world-famous marine biologist who specialized in shark research. Now, she was so famous for her shark research, she actually got the nickname, the Shark Lady. Now, we still have lots of contemporary scientists that are studying sharks today, and that is exactly who we'll be tuning into just in a few moments. But before we dive in, this is going to be an interactive webinar. So not only are we going to be learning about sharks and getting to meet some amazing scientists that work here at Moat, but we're going to keep you on your toes. We're going to see how much you know about sharks. We're going to see how much you are able to give back and see if you can stump our scientists. Now, before we dive in, because this is an interactive presentation, we're going to throw up a few quiz questions throughout our program. So get ready for quiz question number one. So we're going to throw up some polling features. Now, which of these A, B, C, or D relatives are going to be a cousin of a shark? So type into the chat box and let me know who is a cousin of a shark. Is it a skate, a sawfish, a guitar fish, or all of the above? So there's lots of interesting options coming in. All right, I see a lot of people seeing, saying D, but I do see a few people saying A. Ah, oh, it looks like it's kind of all over the map. I mean, is C even an animal, a guitar fish? I don't know. That sounds pretty ridiculous. Well, we are going to come back with that answer right after our current event segment, from our PR manager, Stephanie Kettle. So let's see what's up to date in the world Hi, of everyone. ocean news. I'm Stephanie Kettle, and here's the news that's making waves. In honor of this past Monday, Mount Marine Laboratory and Aquarium announced new efforts to expand coral research and restoration efforts in the Florida Keys and beyond. Moat will be building the first and only coral nursery in Isla Mirada in the Florida Keys at the historic Bud and Mary's Marina. This will allow Moat to expand restoration efforts to an area of the Florida Keys that has often been left out. The nursery will feature 12 raceways to start and fragments of both branching and reef building species of coral. In addition to this new nursery, Moat also announced a new partnership with the group iCare, who will engage citizen scientists and divers in coral restoration and monitoring efforts in Isla Mirada. In honor of the 10th birthday of Moat's underwater coral nursery at Lou Key, restoration scientists threw an underwater birthday party complete with a cake. And lastly, to cap off World Oceans Day, Moat announced plans to build an eco-vault like no other. Moat will build an international coral gene bank at the Moat Aquaculture Research Park in East Sarasota County. This gene bank, purposely chosen to be at an inland location, will be housed in a Category 5 hurricane-resistant building with state-of-the-art environmental systems and controls. Moat already has over 1,600 individual genotypes of corals from 17 different species of Florida coral in their care. This gene bank will ensure that we never lose the diversity of corals that make reef ecosystems so special. Interested in getting involved in reef restoration? Check out the Protect Our Reef specialty license plate at moat.org slash reef dash plate. All right, thank you so much, Stephanie, for all of that wonderful information to see what's going on out there in the world of marine science. Now, speaking of marine science, it was just World Oceans Day on Monday. So what better way to celebrate 
than by bringing in one of our fantastic scientists here at Moat Marine Laboratory. We are going to turn it over to Valerie Hagen, and she is going to be giving us the correct answer to our first quiz question. So, Valerie, what is a relative to a shark? Who is a shark's cousin, A, B, C, or D? Can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Okay. Can you hear us okay? Yeah, unmute. Awesome. Okay. Fantastic. Oh, not to trick you, but the answer is D, all of the above. <clears throat> it is D, all of the above. Now, skates, sawfish, rays, guitarfish, they all look pretty different. So because you are a shark science Valerie, scientist Valerie, can you let us know what do these animals have in common? How are they even related? All of these types of animals are part of a subclass uh, called elasmobranchii. Um, so what this means is the cartilaginous fishes. So instead of having bone like we do, uh, they have cartilage, which is beneficial because it's lighter and they can move around quicker than your average bony fish for us. Gosh, that's so wild. So for all of you out there, if you wiggle your nose, or if you wiggle your ears, then you are touching the same material that sharks have. So the neat thing about sharks is they have no bones in their body. So no bones about it, right? All right, so <laughs> Valerie, sharks are pretty awesome, but you get to study these animals. So that means that you're pretty jawsome yourself. <laughs> so can you tell us a little bit more about who you are? What is your job at Moat? Do you have an average day? What is it like to be a shark scientist? Well, I am a staff biologist here at Moat Marine Laboratory. I am working in the, the uh, Sharks and Rays Conservation Research Program. And to answer your question, there is not a typical day. It's always different. So we've always got different research projects going on. We're looking at different types of science, like physiology or migratory behaviors or sensory and it, it's extremely different. It just depends on the season and what we've got going on, who we're collaborating with. So we can have, we can work with uh, small stingrays, uh, small bull sharks. Um, what else have we done? We've had even Goliath grouper. Um, it's, it's very variant because we have a holding facility here at Moat, uh, which requires a lot of care. So a lot of cleaning, getting in the water. It's not as glamorous as it seems. Um, a lot of hard work, prepping food. We, it's something that I do every day is feed the whatever sharks we have here at Moat in the research lab. Um, and then we also sometimes get fortunate enough to do field work. So we'll head out into the field and collect uh, certain data, depending on what we need at that point in time. So awesome. So I guess you could say that you have a wide array of job <laughs> responsibilities. Ah. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Terrible. Now, you have such an awesome job. So can you tell us a little bit more, how did you even get to become a shark scientist? Did you study anything yeah. in particular? Did you have an internship that really helped you get into where you are? Or did you just kind of fall into it? So my past is um, I graduated from St. Leo University, which is interesting because it's a landlocked school in Florida, close enough to the water. But I just graduated with a bachelor's of science in general biology. I chose that because I didn't know if I wanted to go into veterinary or marine research. And here I am in marine research because I, straight out of college, got an internship here at Moat Marine in the same program that I'm currently in. So your internship turned into your full-time job. And that's yep. really wonderful that you almost did veterinary science, but your shark career track <laughs> is also doing a lot of veterinary science. You're taking care of these yes. animals. You're feeding Absolutely. them. The best there of both worlds. Yeah, and some of my favorite days are when the vets come and check out our sharks. So I get to do both. <clears throat> Awesome. Now, I saw in some of those earlier pictures that you were literally in the tank with some of these animals. Is that scary? Yeah. Oh my gosh. Like, do you have to worry about the fact that if you're feeding these animals, aren't you on the menu? Sharks are terrifying, right? Well, something about being in the tanks with them, which is the same as being in the wild with them, is that sharks are going to be more scared of you than you are of them. So, 
as you can see in the picture that's mostly blue, that, that's a nurse shark. Um, so, yeah, there you go. Uh, that shark's actually avoiding me. I had to approach that shark a little bit to try and get the photo op. So <laughs> they, they don't really want anything to do with you. They mind their own business. You are taking care of these animals and you're so brave that you're not scared of these animals or <laughs> that you're just scary enough that they're scared of you. So not sure if that's a compliment or not, right? <laughs> now, <laughs> so as far as an average day for you goes, you're out on the field. So you do a lot of in-lab research, but I know for a fact that you just got back from a really awesome week-long research trip. So can you tell us some of the really cool things you've been up to just last week? Yeah, um, so I was pretty lucky with that trip. A lot of the time you get stuck on the boat for the whole entire week, but this trip was just a series of day trips, so I got to sleep in my own bed, which was nice. Um, but we were out there actually continuing some research that Dr. Eugenie Clark, our founder, has started way back in the day. So we've got four sampling sites that um, we consistently are looking at. And we do the same fishing methods, same techniques, same bait, same everything, because we're trying to mimic these same conditions, because we just want to know what shark species are changing in that area. So what we've looked at in the past, and actually have already published this, is that um, in the Gulf of Mexico, it seems, at least in our area, that dusky sharks have a species called dusky, um, have pretty much completely disappeared. And so from monitoring over the years and seeing the dusky sharks depleting, we're, we're able to coincide that with like fishing, like commercial fishing um, behaviors or activity and able to see that maybe us humans were the cause of that. So that, that helps science and conservation overall because we're able to communicate that with uh, people who make the laws and they can, they can stop the fishing in certain seasons or at certain distances away from the beach. Um, if we were to discover that maybe black tips are showing up um, near our waters a little later in the summer, that has something to do with climate change. And so that's something that also needs to be addressed uh, with legislature. Um, so that's, that's the main goal of this is just to see potential changes and then make sense of it and see how we can better uh, conserve sharks in general. Well, awesome. So you're not only just doing research regarding one particular species of shark, but you're yeah. also studying just the entire impact and shark ecosystems as well. So yeah. That's so amazing. So big picture stuff, small picture stuff. As far as individual species of sharks go, do you have a favorite? Is there a favorite research project you've worked on? Can you tell us a little bit more? I mean, are, can you even pick a favorite shark or you're not allowed to be biased? <laughs> no, I, I literally can't pick a favorite type of shark because there are over 400 species of shark, over 500 species of ray, um, and they're all so different. They, they range from like centimeters in size to a 40 foot whale shark and they live in all sorts of, uh, I want to say terrains. They can, they can do tide pools or they're in the very deepest depths of the ocean. They're literally have infiltrated every corner of the ocean. <laughs> That's wild. But, now, but that Western photo, um, actually I was present when that was taken. Get out. I did not uh, but actually above the fish right there, there's a shadow and that is uh, my shadow in the background. <laughs> we had to jump in the water to see if we could see if it was a male or female. Um, and that, that was probably my favorite day of work that I've done. So crazy, you know, just like a casual day, just swimming along <laughs> and looking at whale sharks. Same, same, absolutely. <laughs> Now, considering that you're learning a lot about sharks and that, as you mentioned, with the dus dusky shark, for example, their populations are starting to disappear. So in order to prevent these sharks from leaving you in the dark, like the dusky <laughs> shark, ah, terrible, how do you track and monitor these animals? So if you're in the lab or out on a research vessel, can you provide a little more insight into what we do? And before you get there, that's going to bring us up to our second quiz question. So let's see if the audience can guess how you interact with these animals and how you study them in the first place. So quiz question number two, 
how do moat researchers study sharks in the first place? Do they use submarine surveys? Do they use aerial drones? Do they use satellite tags? Or do they use all of the above? So let's see what the audience thinks. Now, as far as submarine survey goes, do you think our scientists are going down and studying them and looking at them in a submarine? Are they flying remote control drones above the ocean to see if they can find sharks? Are they actually catching sharks to track them with satellite tags? Or do you think they're doing a little bit of everything? All right, so it looks like everyone says all of the above. So, Valerie, what is the correct answer? Tricked you. Again, it's not all of the above. It would be C, satellite tags. So all of those methods are ways that you could study sharks, potentially, but Moat, in particular, focuses on satellite tags. I tried to trick the audience a little bit. We can't get, have them get <laughs> right answers all the time, right? <laughs> right. Awesome. So I guess you could say we're just raising the sandbar. Now, <laughs> Valerie, can you tell us a little bit more about some of the amazing tracking and tagging research that you do? And oh my gosh, what even is a satellite tag? <laughs> so satellite tags are super beneficial to the information we can collect because we can't follow sharks around all the time. I can't swim that fast. So if we are able to temporarily and safely capture a shark, put a satellite tag on it and let it roam free, go about its day, normal behavior. Um, when it swims high enough up in the water column, um, that satellite tag will communicate with an actual satellite that's up in the sky called um, Argos. And that satellite is able to, did I lose you? There we go. That satellite is able yeah. to um, send us an email with the GPS coordinates of that individual shark. But it does have to, to swim pretty close up to the surface for us to get that information. Cool. So I guess you could say that the E in email now stand for elasma brank, right? So you're getting some- Yeah, that's what I thought it meant. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Now, sharks, we're learning a lot about sharks, whether you're in the laboratory, whether you're out in the research, on the ocean on a research vessel studying them, but sharks, why are they even important? Why do we care to even care, you know? So what's the purpose? Valerie, can you shed a little light on why should we even bother to study these fish? So sharks are at the top of the food web. Um, they control all of the populations of fish and plants and everything underneath them. And they always, they always try to target things that might be sick and injured. So they eliminate that part of the, the less desirable uh, things that exist in the ocean. And if there were no sharks, all of the big fish would grow out of control. There would be so many of them that they would all be competing for food, and then they wouldn't have any food left. And then when they die, the same thing would happen in every trophic level underneath them. So they're, they're keeping everything in check. And we need to protect them because for, for our own safety, because it eventually leads back to land because all of the ecosystems are eventually connected. So sharks are, that's why I got into shark research is because I realized that they do have so much control over the, the safety of our oceans. <clears throat> Great answer. We actually had a, a guest that just typed into the chat box that called them an apex predator. So you are absolutely yeah. right with all you aspiring shark scientists out there. Look at you with your vocab words. Yes, sharks are apex predators, top of the food chain, just like Valerie said. Now we're going to move on to our next quiz question. So as far as our next quiz question goes, we're going to start talking about some sustainability and conservation of sharks. Because as we just learned, they're really important. So we need to understand what we can do in order to help protect these animals. Now, we're going to better understand what we can do. So unfortunately, sharks aren't doing so well globally. So what do you think is the biggest threat to sharks? Overfishing, population, habitat loss, or all of the above. Now remember, the last one wasn't all of the above. So am I trying to trick you this time? Is there <laughs> one do you think that is more threatening to sharks than another? All right, I still see Ds, and I do see a few people saying As. Hmm. 
Oh man, look. Oh, there's a B. Okay, right on. Pollution. All right, Valerie. So, what is the correct answer? Global shark populations not doing so well. What is causing their population to literally sink? So, again, this is going to be a D, all of the above. I might have misled you with mainly talking about overfishing earlier in this uh, program, but it's definitely all three. Um, I could touch on all of those if you want. <laughs> Talk that much? Overfishing. <laughs> so I heard this really complex science term called bycatch, and I hear that's a bad thing for sharks, but what's the issue? I don't understand. What's going on with bycatch? So bycatch is a term um, that addresses anything that fishermen catch that they don't intend to catch. They have no control over, so say they're fishing for grouper. They have no control that a shark isn't going to come and bite that hook. So bycatch means accidental catch. A lot of the time, uh, they'll, they'll reel in their catch, and the shark might already be dead or not doing that well, and then they'll let it go. Um, so unfortunately, this does cause a lot of shark death, whether, and certain species actually uh, don't handle that stress well at all, and you can send them on their way, and they seem like they're fine and dandy, and they can actually later now because you're a trained group of scientists and when you're tracking and tagging these animals how do you get them on board how do you attach the tag how do you make sure that bycatch isn't an issue when you're working with these sharks well we focus mainly on a type of fishing called drum lining which actually is beneficial to the health of the sharks we also don't have control that we might accidentally catch something else, but most of the time we're only catching sharks. Sharks, we're really lucky with the, I guess it's uh, the location here in Sarasota. Uh, but drum lines actually are great because you drop a weight, you have a buoy attached to that weight, and then a buoy attached to that buoy, and then at the bottom of the weight is about a hundred feet of line. So if a shark bites onto that hook, it has about a hundred feet to safely swim and, and flush water over its gills and almost behave as it would until we come see that there's something on that line and pull them right up, pop a tag in them and send them on their way. Cool. So I guess that comes with good gear, sustainable yeah. choices, and years of experience. That's yeah, awesome. So. Now we have an aspiring marine biologist in our chat that just mentioned O-Search. Do you, what is O-Search and do you get to work with them? I wish I would get to work with them personally, but my boss is actually, Bob Huter is the chief scientist and advisor for OSEARCH. So he is constantly going on their expeditions, uh, being their main go-to person um, when it comes to like the health of the animal and just overseeing everything. Um, and I don't know what their next expedition was, but I know they frequent the Carolinas area and they're targeting the white shark, the great white shark, um, most of the time. They do catch other species and they'll satellite tag them as well because it's all valuable information. But um, a couple years ago, they were able to discover a white shark nursery off the coast of New York, which wouldn't have been possible without satellite tags. They found that all of the juveniles were hanging out right, right around there because they like a little cooler water. You'll, you'll get them in the Gulf of Mexico where we are, but not as frequently. Um, yeah, O-Search is a really great organization, and we partner with them. <clears throat> One of these days, you'll be able to get to work with them much on a much closer relationship. Now, the, now, I'm super aware that suddenly we're almost out of time, which is such a huge bummer. So this just flew by. Valerie, this is such a blast. So before we <laughs> close... I want to hit a sustainability plug. So one of the easiest things, no matter where you are, from Florida to California, no matter if you are right near the ocean or inland, one of the easiest things you can do is just choose sustainable seafood. As Valerie mentioned, bycatch is the biggest threat to sharks. So you want to be focusing on seafood that doesn't have a high bycatch risk. So choose Seafood Watch approved seafood. If you download the free Seafood Watch app on your smart device, it will let you know what types of seafood are sustainable sustainable and ocean healthy. Green means go, yellow means yield, red means stop. It's set up just like a stoplight. Additionally, you can support Valerie's research. How great would that be? 
So here at Moat Marine Laboratory, we're a nonprofit, so we always are looking for grant funds and just engagement and participation in general. So if you are a shark lover and if you want to support Valerie with everything she's doing, then you can actually adopt a shark. And not only do you get an adorable shark plush, but you get to see and get a direct pen pal relationship with some of our shark scientists. Now, I see, Valerie, that we have about five minutes left. So let's open it up to some questions. I've seen some questions pouring in, which is super exciting. So the first question we have is, well, I saw a question about how can you tell a shark's age way back in the beginning? So Valerie, how do you age a shark when you're studying them? So we don't actually have a foolproof method, um, unfortunately, unless the shark is deceased. Um, if you cut into a vertebrae, then there are rings in there, kind of like there are rings inside of a tree. But we don't want to do that. We'll avoid doing that if possible at all costs. So there have been, and it's different for each species, but there are many studies that have been done, some here, some other places, that track um, the growth of sharks as they age. So at this size, we can guesstimate that they're a certain age. Um, some sh sharks have been born in captivity, so you're able to watch them from day one and keep them all, I, I don't even know how long. Um, but there's, there's many studies. I know that Carl Luer, who is our biomedical sciences guy here, he did it uh, with nurse sharks a while back. That's actually a perfect transition to another question that popped up. How many sharks have you worked with here at Moat? What species? I know you mentioned bull sharks. I know oh. you mentioned nurse sharks. But what we want to know, what, like how many sharks? <laughs> What's your how? shark resume look like? I would have to guess. I'd have to pull up my shark resume. I've done lemons, silkies, bonnet heads, black tips, bull sharks, um, nurse sharks, hmm. uh, hammerheads. Did I say hammerheads? Um, a, a lot of rays, too. We have Atlantic stingrays. We've done cow nose ray, leopard ray. Um, my favorite ray species is definitely the uh, spotted eagle ray, white spot. Cool. Right, they're beautiful. Um, and the list goes on. That's just off the top of my head. Gosh, that's awesome. So I guess you could say you have a SEA CV, right? A really big CV. <laughs> oh, that's terrible. All right. So another question is, how do you tell if it's a boy shark or a girl shark? How do you know? I mean, a fish is a fish, right? That is a great question. Um, so. Oh. Sorry, I think you got muted on us. Can you re repeat that? Can you hear us okay? Oh, oh, sorry, Valerie. I think you got muted for some um, accidental reason. Oh, there, we, there we go. All right. So how do you tell if it's a boy shark or a girl shark? So boy sharks will have a little finger-like apparatus at the base of their pelvic fins. These are called claspers. Um, they, I always explain them as two finger-like protrusions. Um, and sharks do internal insemination. Um, and so, yeah, there's the female. And then the females just don't have that. The boys have an extra little thumb right on the base of their body. That's really good to know. Now, and they have two. <laughs> have two. One on each side. I love that. Now, I think we have time for one last question, and Heather has a really good one. So she asks, okay. concerned that you are so brave, do you have any battle scars? Have you ever been injured working with these animals? Sharks have a really bad reputation, but I know you're brave, but is there any reason to be worried? There, there is a reason to be worried with handling sharks. There's definitely the opportunity for them to get the upper hand every once in a while. Um, I know that I've personally never been bitten. Um, I've worked at that. Moat for about four and a half years. Um, but anyone I know that has ever been bitten by a shark, it's been pretty much, it's been a lemon shark because they're so extremely flexible. They're actually capable of biting their own tails. They can pretty much bend themselves in a circle. So you really got to watch out for the lemon sharks. That doesn't mean they'll come for you, but when we have them out of the water handling, they're, they're just kind of flexible. That's super good to know. So here at Moat Marine Lab, we don't like to say shark attack. We like to say shark encounter because odds are we did something that bothered them. 
And as Valerie has proven, not only is she really brave, but sharks don't go out of their way to bother people. They're too busy managing the ocean's health in general. Now, unfortunately, we are out of time. Oh my gosh, this has flown by. But I see that we have a lot of questions that are still pouring in. So do not fear because you'll be able to stay in touch with Valerie. So if you join us on Flipgrid, we have a really awesome free video voicemail service. So for every question we didn't get to today, if you join us on Flipgrid, you can ask a free video question and we will forward that along to Valerie. Poor Valerie, we're just giving her even more work. But she'll be able to <laughs> answer with a personalized video answer to all of your sharky questions. So make sure you visit us on our Flipgrid account. It's a great way to stay in touch with us and consider us here at Moat Marine Laboratory, your ocean science pen pals whenever you have any questions. So we have hit 2.30. Valerie, do you have any last closing statements, thoughts, words of advice you'd like to give all of our jawsome friends out there? I'd say the best thing to do, guys, which if you're tuning in, you're already doing, is educate yourself. Crop sharks, uh, the whole entire ocean. Um, it was World Oceans Day, and she's suffering a little bit. So to be an advocate, you just need to learn. <clears throat> answer. That's right. So happy World Oceans Day to everyone. Once again, my name is Ross. That was Valerie. We're coming to you live from Moat Marine Laboratory. Thank you so much for tuning in to this Summer of Science webinar series. Tune in next Wednesday at two o'clock Eastern time for a manatee adventure. So we're going to be meeting some manatee scientists and we're going to be transitioning from fish to mammals. So once again, thank you so much for tuning in and we hope to see you next week. Bye everyone.